here. Did you know? You can tell if you look for the symbols. Yeah, it's the, it's the checkerboard pattern and the black occultic costume. Let's call it a costume. You see, there's a group of people, in fact quite a large group of people, who perceive themselves to be better than everyone else. This is the, yeah, honk if you're better than everyone else. And they form a kind of shadowy, occult government. Let's, sorry, let's use the word council, because that's the word that they like to use. Because to overtly control government and politics and finance, is a little bit showy and a little bit obvious. It's much better to do things from behind the scenes. And so you will call yourself a council instead. Now, these people have been in this country and throughout Europe for many hundreds of years. They in fact have formed the fabric of what we call society. And of course, they're mildly interested in creating impressive architecture. It's part of their occultism. Of course, the idea of the the idea of the uh, occult. I just didn't want to scare the security guard. Um, is to have things sort of shielded, hidden. There are symbols that some people might recognize, whereas others, not so much. But if you know how to follow the symbols, if you study their modus operandi, you can track them down. And uh, I'm going to take you to a place that I have found, which you could call the headquarters of the council. But first, I'm just going to take you into St. James's Park and show you their symbol. Yes, I am talking about the pelicans. Now to your average observer, coming past the park, you know, wandering past here, look, looking at the little cottage and thinking, oh, it's the bird keeper's cottage. I wonder if he's in charge of keeping the pelicans. And why are the pelicans here again? Oh, and look at them with their, with their wings out. Oh, why do they keep pelicans here? Oh, it's because you know, St. James's Park used to be part of London Zoo. And they, you know, they still keep a few animals here just to remind us of the history of the place. Oh, isn't that wonderful? So, nothing more than that. Nothing more than the fact that this used to be London Zoo. Um, 
which moved, but the pelicans stayed. Oh, well, it probably doesn't mean anything. Well, yes, it does. In fact, it's a very obvious occultic symbol of a society of men who have been encamped in this town for many, many, many generations, and they form the natural linking between the authoritarian rule of royal and business and society in general. They are the guiding hand, the council of men. And their pelicans are kept here, and I'm going to show you why the pelicans are representative of the ultimate power of number 10. And no, I'm not talking about number 10 Downing Street, because you know, number 10, a powerful universal number, but number 10 Downing Street isn't the real number 10. Oh no, it's somewhere else, it's, it's over there near where all of the secret societies are based. But first, earlier I went off to Kensington to just study up on architecture. just walking along in the middle of the road. Um, it's one of those things that, you know, getting used to pointing a video camera at yourself um, in the public and sort of talking and, you know, having people watch you like you're mad um, is quite a tricky thing. So it's best to sort of go to extreme levels by like literally just walking down the middle of the road and past all of the traffic-y uh, cars so that they can have a good look at you. And it just sort of makes me better well-worn at uh, just talking randomly and strangely into a camera in the public. The occult, the occult. The idea of the occult is that there is something in the way, something obscuring the view of what is real. Um, in terms of uh, a true occultation of the sun, which is a solar eclipse, uh, you know, if, I, if my head gets in the way of the sun, I'm occulting the sun, and you can't see the light. Uh, of course, the light, in terms of like, true occultism, is actually to do with uh, knowledge. Am I going to get run down by calm? Maybe I will. It's about knowledge. So, you know, the true meaning of the occult in, in real terms and how it operates in this country and in, in many other countries. Uh, talking of the occult, by the way, look, just behind me, protecting the French Embassy. I don't know if you can see the nice occultic black uniforms of our occultic brethren with their uh, checkerboard hats protecting the French Embassy. Um, yeah, there's something in the way of showing you what is really there. And the symbolic light, of course, often displayed as either a, uh, a lion. I'm looking for a lion. Is that a lion? No. Uh, there are lots of lions. I'm just going to cross the road, see what happens. There are lots of lions. Uh, oh god, the camera work is fucking amazing. There they are, look. All lining up. They're the symbol of the sun. Uh, the symbol of enlightenment, the symbol of 
knowledge and of course uh, knowledge is why all of these people come here there's lots of people here I mean it's a quiet day is what Thurs Thursday it's a Thursday so there's not that many people here but they do come to the Natural History Museum to learn about you know life the universe and everything and animals and everything that is created by the divine presence uh, except what they get inside the natural history museum is not actually the real um, the real story of for example the people who created this building uh, they certainly thought themselves much more illumined than the people who may gobble up and consume uh, all that is displayed in the Natural History Museum. I'm not sure if that sentence made any sense. Uh, hopefully it did. Um, the true occultic nature of this building is that it's itself, as he stands behind a vehicle that has his engine on, which is really great for audio quality, is that this building is actually hiding the architecture that is behind it. Now, you can't see the true layout of what is here, and neither can anybody else, because the Natural History Museum is getting in the way. But this is the beginning of a line of architecture which, within the centre of it, is showing us the true meaning of what is here, and using the wonders of technology, which is why they're so happy, they're, they're just they're just absolutely ecstatic with the wonders of life and technology in general. Using the wonders of technology, I can just hop into the air and show you. I'm now the other side of it. it. Really hurts being dropped from the sky like that, you know. Uh, the Albert Memorial. I've talked about that in a previous video, just calling it basically a, a symbol of death created by uh, a lot of inbred, way too wealthy people. Um, and you could, you know, argue that sort of very simple thing for all of this, the sort of dome but, you know, pyramidal stepped uh, object in a line with the memorial. Um, you could just sort of argue all of this out and say, yeah, you know, there was a lot of cash about, there was a lot of money about, they needed to build something or other, and it just so happened they decided to base a lot of their stuff on sort of ancient symbolism and all of that kind of stuff. Um, I would agree, yes, generally. Um, it's just basically a it was the fashion of the time to put in occultic, symbolic, herald heraldic things um, into architecture, but it's really the structure right in the center of this that piqued my interest when I first spotted it. Um, the big tower in between, by the way, with the green dome, is called the Queen's Tower. It used to be the case that before most of this was here, there was a thing called the Imperial Institute. Uh, the only remaining section of the Imperial Institute is the Queen's Tower, which is uh, that object there. Um, so it starts with the Natural History Museum on the other side of that. Um, the opposite corresponding is the Albert Memorial. And then it goes to the Queen's Tower and the Royal Albert Hall, but it's in between those things that I'm interested in, which is why I'm going to take you over here.
It is uh, the symbol that the true religious philosophy uh, is the study of the astral bodies of which you are one. So it's the study of the movement and whims of the sun, the moon, the earth, all other planetary bodies, and of course yourself, because the occultic meaning is that the universe does have gods in it. Um, if you've ever looked out into the universe and thought, this is an empty place. Where is God? Well, you were looking in the wrong place because the true universal consciousness and sense and the all-knowing, all-perceiving being is in fact yourself. And for sure you could say, oh, the all-seeing eye of the Illuminati. Yeah, it's not really that. Although you could say that the all-seeing eye derives from the same symbolism that that is also a symbol of, which is just the symbol of knowledge, enlightenment, and initiation. The, uh, the pyramid, which is an architectural symbol, actually represents the perfect number, something known as the tetractus. Tectractus, which is the pyramid made up of five, uh, sorry, the pyramid made up of ten points. So it's one at the top, and then a line of two, and then a line of three, and then a line of four, and that equals ten, which is the universal number. Uh, the pyramid of ten represents all knowledge. It represents the universe, both exterior and interior, meaning that the tetractus is a symbol of the arcane religion that recognizes that God is you. Once you've gone through some initiations, that is, and that is essentially what the mystery schools are about and why so many buildings are emblazoned with either the pyramid or the tetractus itself or just some other, you know, sun-worshipping golden thing. So I don't know if you saw that in the distance, but that was, you know, a fine setup of uh, showing, you know, your average observer enjoying the pelicans for their natural beauty and their curiousness, yet being flagrantly unaware of the actual meaning of them. Uh, it's quite apt that I make this video on St. George's Day because it turns out that it's a tradition on St. George's Day or to play like the national anthem in the background, that's what you're hearing from like the Wellington Barracks. Um, and also to wear a, um, a red rose on your chest. So uh, presumably you have to wear a white suit and then right in the middle is a red rose. This is what we're supposed to do on St George's Day. There were several articles in the newspapers this morning talking about how nobody really knows the real meaning of St. George. Um, and as I read those, of course, I was like astounded. Like, really? People don't realize the, the actual meaning of all of the occultic symbols that they use? How odd. I'm sure it wasn't designed to confuse people. Now, I illustrated with the tetractus that the number 10 is the universal number. That is why number 10 Downing Street has a powerful image. I also told you that it's not the real number 10 that represents the real power. Uh, that is just a short distance past St. James's Palace, which is just there. I've done a lot of walking today. Luckily, I don't have to water this. I'm going to use the power of modern technology.
uh, Duke Street, St. James's, which um, you could say is sort of part of hidden London. It's not looking its best at the moment, they're digging it all up. Through there is uh, Mason's Yard, and that's where, like, all of the, uh, the top-notch music industry folks used to hang around in the 1960s. You know, back in the day when uh, the music industry was still controlled by criminals? Oh, sorry. I mean, you know that the music industry is controlled by criminals? So Mason's Yard, uh, the white cube is in there, and uh, the blue door at the very back is basically the back of the Council on Foreign Relations, of course, which started as a secret society known as the Round Table. And if you go down to number 10, Duke Street, you will find this building here, which I will walk away from and hopefully you'll be able to see it in the background. Number 10, number 10 Duke Street, a building that is actually framed at the end of this road by, uh, by all the buildings. So as you're approaching it, no doubt, it looks sort of fairly impressive, certainly a little bit different to all the rest. And that's because it is a little bit different to all the rest. Uh, it is, if you look it up on the internet, and uh, I think generally like they have panels around here where you can just look stuff up on the internet. Um, yeah, here's one there. Let's um, have the number 10 show us. So if you bring up Google, and you put into Google 10 Duke Street, London, and you press return, you will find out that it is the Supreme World Council of Freemasonry. Nothing strange about that. Uh, there is a tab there where you can click uh, gallery, and you'll see various images, you know, the way that they like to show you various symbols that represent who they are, and you'll find within that set of symbols, of course, a lovely image of a pelican, and the, uh, the pelican is feeding its young with its own blood. Uh, the red in the middle represents the rose, the, uh, the wings coming out either side represent the cross, the rose cross of something known as Rosicrucianism which was adapted uh, into Freemasonry and just is the symbol that basically represents the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. Now, just you know, having a passerby looking at a pelican and thinking, oh, that's nice, and not realizing that it's a potent symbol of a controlling arm of society, uh, you could say is all part of the structure of how we are governed. Um, always best, I think, if you want to have a quiet life, not to look too far into these symbols. Uh, better, probably, to just ignore them and suffer from what the Freemasons say you suffer from, which is the terrible affliction of ignorance.